So you want to buy a car on Facebook Marketplace, you entered your area, you entered your mile range that you're willing to drive, and you start scrolling through and flipping through these car listings. But this could be pretty daunting as there's quite a few cars to scroll through. And how do you know you're buying a good car at the end of the day? How do you deal with negotiating and all that? So this is how I go about buying used cars on Facebook Marketplace. And I like to separate this into two categories. One being, am I trying to buy a car to flip and sell and make a profit? Or is this a car that I'm gonna keep for a while? And maybe I don't care as much for the price. As I still want a good price, but a flip, you absolutely need to win at the purchase price. A car you're buying for yourself, you don't need to win at the purchase price. And that's important to remember. So if I'm looking for something to flip, some keywords you can search for generally is mechanic special. And this will pop up anything that mentions mechanic special in the description. And you can go through this and look through what you can handle or not. So like I pop on this Dodge Charger, don't really wanna watch a video. This was a police unit and new transmission, but needs catalytic converter, classic charger for sale. So you get an idea of what's out here and we saw the price was 2200 or best offer. And we can just keep moving on. If we like that, favorite or message. If we don't, move on. Now, another search I like to do is search by vehicles. And let's search by price. Let's say 3000 is the max that I want to spend. So I'll hit enter. We'll pull up our results. And this is just a quick way to get some filter results within your budget. And Sometimes these cheap cars are a good way of just finding something that's maybe worth potential and flipping, uh, like Honda's Accord, it's like cheap car, old car, it's gonna need a lot of work, but hey, maybe it makes sense, especially if you're familiar with the car. Mustang, I'm not familiar with Mustangs, I would definitely stay away, but that's just because I'm not familiar with them. Now, I am particularly looking for a four-door. And what's the best four-door? Not really, but I like Saturn. So we're gonna scroll through this list of Saturns in the Atlanta area. So I'm gonna scroll through here and I'm gonna find something that I like and we can go through, but something you'll find quite often is a nice photo like this of this old 94 Saturn, it says. But you scroll through and this photo is a, a Lexus interior. And then here's an SC2 which is not the same one in the listing. So yeah, lots of weird things happen on Facebook Marketplace that you just have to be aware of. So now I found this car that I like, but that price I think is a little high for a cheap Saturn. I mean, I remember when these cars were 500 bucks, but two years ago, <laughs> those times have changed. So here we are, and I'm looking for a car that I'm going to keep. For, for a little bit. So I don't necessarily need a flip car. I don't need to get the best price possible, but I still wanna get a fair deal. I'm looking through this, read the description, under 100,000 miles, which is pretty crazy for a 97. And a 1997 out here in Georgia does not need an emissions test as of 2023. So that's good. I think it's 25 and older, don't need emissions tests. But let's look through these photos. So they actually show the miles. Uh, the interior looks pretty nice just from these photos. It looks like there's some scratches on the paint. Um, this st sticker thing on the license plate, or it's just a paper plate. When there's a dealer that's selling a car on Facebook Marketplace, it makes me a little more cautious. I prefer to buy from private party, just individuals like me. That's just because individuals are more likely to negotiate. Dealers most likely won't negotiate with you. And that's just the reality of it. So I prefer private party individuals just for that fact. But other than that, dealers are great because they can get your title and stuff all done, handed right there on the spot. So interior is still pretty good. It's automatic, which is gonna be perfect because I only have one automatic car and my wife would prefer another automatic just in case something happens to her car again has a battery in the seat so right away that's telling me this car probably has a new battery or it has some battery issues 
So that's something to consider. We can see this tear in the carpet down here and some wear in the uh, rug right here, floor mat, but uh, no big deal. And we get the VIN and that's it for the photos. So we don't get to see the engine or anything. Now this, just doing research online, just knowing a little bit about these cars. This is supposed to come with a 1.9 liter in line four. And oh, that's that's the engine I want. I, I want the dual overhead cam in this rather than the single overhead cam just because of more power. And I'm just more familiar with dual overhead cam, but that's just specific to me in this car. Looking through this though, everything checks out for me other than this 3000 price. So I'm gonna save this and I'm just keep, keep an eye on it. And if they drop the price because no one wants to pay 3000 for a Saturn, then I'll come back and message the person. So I'll get back to you if that happens. And as you can see, the Saturn is now sold. I did in fact purchase this. So I'm gonna walk you through my inspection and everything, but the price did come down from that 3000 to 2200. I can tell you, I did not pay 2200 for this car. I was still able to negotiate lower. The description changed as well. This time it says, put a new battery in the car. Sometimes it starts, sometimes it doesn't. So what I was made aware of as I was going to see this car the next day was this car sometimes has an issue starting and I asked for a quick description and to me it sounded like a bad battery. You turn the key and nothing happens. But sometimes when you're speaking to people that aren't so mechanical, you kind of have to take their word with a grain of salt because sometimes they think they're hearing something but it's actually something else really. So just something to keep in mind. But yeah, we bought this car. We did not pay 2200 and yeah, there's some issues with the car, but it's a cheap car. So let's go see it in person and let me take you through my inspection process. Now that we see the car in person, we can inspect it and get a good idea of the condition of this car. So right away, you look at paint. Scratches are all over this car, if you can see. The paint's real dirty. Dirt's going to hide some of those scratches sometimes. Dents you'll usually be able to see. But right away we see the paint not in excellent condition it's okay for a cheap car now the other thing you want to look to, for is the tires do the tires have good tread are they dry rotted and cracking or are they pretty good like these now there's also you want to check the dot code as you see here it says 0210 so this is the second week of 2010 that these tires were made these tires are very old we're going to have to get new tires on this car eventually and that's something we'll throw in when we negotiate the price on this car while you're looking at the tires check out the rims as well you see these are heavily curb rashed damage this bad means they might be out of round and you're gonna feel that vibration on highway speeds it's just something to keep in mind but it definitely can be replaced and fixed I noticed the key ring right here for the lock cylinder is missing but other than that, this car seems to be mostly complete with a few dents and scratches. And we already know it's gonna need new tires and the rims are heavily curb rashed. Now let's check out the interior of this car. So on the inside, see a little stain here on this door panel. We see a little tear in the seat here. The floor mat's pretty dirty, the carpet underneath is also dirty, and there's a tear where your foot will rest. We also see a little tear on that door card, and the carpet is raising from the seam on that side. But, dash is not cracked. The seats are in pretty good condition for a 97. Back seats as well, excellent condition. The headliner is drooping down. This is gonna need some attention. It's just eventually it's just gonna fall on your face. Now there is also an aftermarket radio in here. This is a brand I don't really recognize. I don't recognize this specific one. So I'm gonna have to keep that in mind. And I don't know if this has Bluetooth or aux. I know it's a CD one, but who uses CDs anymore? While you're in here, check the mileage. This says 99,500. Compare it against the ad. Uh, this is spot on with the ad, so no concerns there. Also, pretty good for under 100,000 miles for a 97. 
check the glove box, make sure it opens and closes. Um, there'll probably be some papers in there that are maybe personal to the old owner or owner before. Whatever, just inspect it. I don't know if you can see on camera, but I can see past this. And there's an aftermarket speaker in here. And so if there's one aftermarket speaker, good chance we have at least two, maybe all four aftermarket speakers. Now check this out when I close the door. Yeah, that's not a normal noise. So it seems like the power locks are acting up. Something's going on there. The owner did tell me that the battery dies overnight. So that that's a really good suspicion of what's causing the battery to die, but that is not right. <laughs> Now the part I'm usually most concerned about is, is the car mechanically sound? So pop the hood, let's look under, and right away we see oil all over the top of the engine. So it's leaking out of this valve cover gasket. It's going to need a valve cover gasket. The other thing is we want to make sure, is there any other leaks? This power steering pump is covered in oil, but is that power steering fluid or is that oil from the valve cover? Most likely just the valve cover, just speaking from experience here. We have this weird strap on the battery that I don't really like. Looks like if there was another nut, it would hold it down better. So maybe we'll have to get a nut to just hold the battery down better. Over here we have a weird T off of the positive. It's a black cable, which is always good to run black off of positive. The valve cover or the, the valve body over the transmission, the transmission pan up here is just coated in oil and grease and grime. So good chance that we could be leaking some transmission fluid out as well. But we'll know better if we check down below. If the car you're purchasing needs emissions, every car has the emission hose routing under the hood somewhere on a sticker. So take a moment to look over that. Make sure you got all the hoses where they're supposed to be if you don't immediately recognize everything. Now speaking of this emission hose, we got our PCV valve hose. This hose is dry rotted. This hose is going to need to be replaced. This isn't that big of a deal, but it definitely needs to be replaced. We got a full thing of washer fluid wipe. <laughs> washer fluid, so that's good. Now we want to check the coolant to make sure there's no oil, no combustion in it or anything. But before we do that, grab one of the radio radiator hoses that you can reach. Give a squeeze, make sure it's not hot, make sure there's no pressure in it. And if you can squeeze it, then there's no pressure and we can open this slowly. Now sometimes people will have cars running before you get there and it will be warm and you won't be able to do this. So if you can, always ask that the engine's cold when you get there. Now inside of here, you wanna make sure it has the right color coolant or if, if it's green, you don't want to see any sludge in there, especially with GMs because GMs had Dexcool. Dexcool does not mix with the universal green, so make sure it's green, make sure it's it smells sweet like coolant and not stinky like exhaust. So this smells just like coolant. I don't have any concerns. I don't see any sludge, no brown or anything, and this has the orange dex cool in it right now and we can also take off the oil cap and under here just take a look make sure it's not frothy or anything like that if you can see a look into the rockers or anything in this valve cover try to see make sure it's clean and not sludge take a sniff make sure it doesn't smell like gas or anything and if we're all good no frothiness then Pull out the dipstick. Have a look at the oil color. If it's that light color, then it's, it's new, it's fresh, it's good. If it's real dark black, then it probably needs to be changed. And give it a sniff as well. You want to make sure it does not smell like gas. You want, it should just smell like oil, but you should know what gas smells like. Make sure it doesn't smell like gas. And if we're good, put it back in. Transmission 
fluid is right here as well. Pull it out. Make sure it doesn't smell burnt. The color is supposed to be like a reddish pink color. This is a little on the dark side, so maybe it needs to be replaced. Don't pay too much attention to the level because normally automatic transmissions have to be checked when the engine's warmed up and it's in park running. So just engine turned off, don't worry about the level, just give it a smell, make sure it doesn't smell burnt. If it's burnt, you may have a transmission issue. Now after looking at the top side of the engine, go down, lay under it, take a look, make sure you, you don't have any rust or any rotted out frame or anything like that. Make sure the suspension looks decent. You'll feel the suspension during the test drive, but you just want to make sure it's nothing obviously bad. We do see oil all over this transmission right here and over the oil pan. But we already know it has a valve cover leak, possibly more. And again, if yours needs to have an emissions test done or a smog test, make sure the catalytic converter is there. When you pull up to the emissions test, the first thing they do is check that the catalytic converter is there and it's in the correct location. Okay, now we're ready to start the engine up and give it a listen. I like to do it with the hood open, so if there's any sounds, we can quickly identify it. Make sure you're in park, foot on the brake, start it up. And this starts up immediately. But right away, I'm noticing the tachometer, the RPM gauge, is doesn't seem to be functioning. If I give it a little gas, does it go up? Nope, looks like we don't have RPM right now. So that's something to consider. But we'll let it warm up. We want to keep an eye on this coolant temperature gauge. Make sure it doesn't overheat while it's warming up. Now let's check the engine. Make sure there's no crazy vibrations. It, engine should run very smooth. You'll feel it a little bit, but it shouldn't be really shaking or anything crazy. That is a good running engine. No belt noises, nothing. I'll let it warm up for maybe 30 more seconds, and then we'll take this for a test drive. It does seem like the tachometer came back, but it's kind of sticking, so something's a little off with this tachometer. And while it's running here, now's a good time to turn the fan on, turn the AC on, turn your lights on. And we could turn the hazards on as well take a walk around while it's running we're trying to make sure that the engine doesn't overheat right now so we're doing a little bit of stalling but we'll take a look around make sure we have both lights blinking in the front and we go to the back side and we have a left blinker but not a right blinker okay so let me turn the hazards off let me turn the right blink, left blinker, and as you see, blinking normally, right blinker, and it's going faster. Now since we saw with the hazards that the back right was not on, your back right turn signal doesn't work. Okay, so now we're back. Feel the AC. Is it cold? This is not. It's not cold. What we can do real quick is take another look under the engine. And under the engine bay, you should see this disc in front of the AC compressor spinning. Because we, we turn the AC on, but it's not spinning. It's staying stationary. You can see the three weight dots in the front. So the AC compressor is not spinning. Either the compressor itself is bad, or usually you're just low on Freon. So we'll keep that in mind, but AC is not currently working. Alright, I'm going to try the window motors, make sure they all work back right does not seem to be going down neither does the left all right well we have the front ones working and be careful because sometimes motors will go down sometimes they won't come back up now we'll take this for a short drive we don't need to drive far for a test drive driving far on a test drive is just about a waste of time for both parties involved and we can stay in the neighborhood to do just about everything we need So right away, we can take our hands off when we're on level ground. Make sure it pulls straight. This pulls to the right. So we already know it needs tires. It's going to need an alignment because it's pulling to the right. Just no, no way around that. 
and listen to the engine, make sure it sounds good, make sure there's no dragging noise from the brakes. That's why I like to roll the windows down on the test drive. And then you wanna make sure your speedometer works as well. Again, keep an eye on your coolant temperature gauge, make sure you're not overheating or anything. I just gave, we came to a stop and I didn't feel any pulsing in the brake pedal. It just, it sounded good, no loud met metallic noises or anything. And we could drive 25 miles per hour in the neighborhood and really learn almost everything we need to know about this engine. We'll hit a bump here, listen to the suspension, and there is no noises. So I'm gonna get to the next straight and we'll turn around, we'll see how the turning radius is, make sure there's no noises when you're turning sharply. Let's do a sharp turn here and make sure there's no noises. Nothing. We'll go in a reverse. And we just did a two point turn with no issues. Power steering obviously works because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do that with one hand. We'll hit a bump again and give it a listen. No crazy clunking noises or anything. Steering wheel didn't shake violently. This seems to be doing good. So this tells me everything I need to know about the suspension. Everything is as good as it should be for an old 97 car. There's really no present issues that we have to worry about. Okay, last thing we wanna check is how it responds under throttle. So we can give it some throttle here and then we'll quickly get off of it. So I'll step on it. Okay, so we downshifted from our probably third gear into second. We gave it throttle, it went up to third gear and now we're cruising probably in fourth gear. So that tells me everything I need to know and that's as simple as your test drive really needs to be. Now again, checking the coolant gauge, we are good. Now we wanna test the heat. I'll turn it on to hot, give it a feel, make sure it's really hot and it is. We'll turn it back to cold, make sure it goes to cold. Try out the different selectors in here. Make sure it goes down to your feet. Make sure the defroster works up there. Everything seems to work. And I am confident that this car is mechanically sound. And another quick check. Go to the tailpipe, put your hand over it. If you feel any inconsistencies, that could be a misfire. That maybe you just can't hear. But when you do this, if it's not consistent here out of the tailpipe, then you know you have a misfire. All right, we will turn the engine off. Turn the headlights off so that stuff's beeping. And then we'll try turning it back on. Make sure it turns back on once it's warm. And it does, and it starts immediately too, which is good. Now the only thing we can't really tell on a short test drive like that is, how does it do on highway speeds? Does it shake? Are the wheels unbalanced? And the reason I don't feel like that's really necessary is most of the time when you go to look at a car, it needs tires or the wheels are curb rashed. And just automatically you should know and figure and account for, you're probably gonna need to put tires on it. And if you put tires on it, you're gonna get the wheels balanced. And if the wheels aren't good, then you're gonna need new wheels. So that's just something you kinda have to budget in no matter what, whenever you look at a car. Or you just live with it if it has an issue. Like this is a cheap car. I mean, we're going to put new tires on it because the tires are 13 years old and that's dangerous. But the wheels, we'll just live with it. If there's a vibration on highway speeds, we'll live with it. It's a cheap car. And you get what you pay for sometimes. But that is perfectly acceptable. And the car seems to be mechanically sound. Now we can go on to talking over the price. When negotiating, you have to know what kind of car you're dealing with and who your audience is, who you're negotiating with. Cheap cars like this, sometimes you probably won't be able to get that much negotiated out of it. Sometimes people think their car is worth more than it actually is. 
and you have to tread that needle sometimes and be cautious, polite, respectful, but end of the day, when you're negotiating, you're negotiating for the benefit of you, but you also need to make the seller satisfied in that they got a sale and they have cash in their hand now. Now what's actually worth negotiating on this car? Well, we'll start with the tires. The tires are old, they have to be replaced. Uh, the wheels being curb rash, not really worth mentioning, but the tires being 13 years old, and if you can show the seller that dot code, that date code, then that's even better. Then they'll have n nothing to disagree with. The paint being scratched up, not really worth bringing up on an old cheap car like this. It just, it is what it is. The noise that the door locks make is definitely worth bringing up. And the fact that the battery dies overnight, we need to keep that in consideration. Is the door locks an easy fix? Is diagnosing the battery dying overnight easy? We need to keep that in mind. It is worth mentioning, however, that the AC does not work. So when you turn the AC on and you press that AC button, that commands the AC compressor to turn on. So show the seller that when you press this AC button, go to the engine, the compressor is not kicking on. That tells you right away that the AC does not work. A lot of times when you go to buy a car and it's cooler outside, and you turn the fan on, you click the AC button, and the air feels cool, a lot of times the seller thinks the AC actually works, especially if it's a flip car that they haven't paid that much attention to. But if you show them the compressor is not spinning, then they have nothing to argue against. And it's just fact that either low on Freon or the compressor itself is bad. And negotiating, you always have to plan for the worst case. Now my negotiating went something like this. I know you feel you've priced this car accordingly, knowing the issues like the paint, the headliner falling, and it just being an older car. However, I feel like there's still some room to work on the price to make us both happy here. First off, the tires, you saw the date code, they're 13 years old, that's just a safety hazard, they need to be replaced right away. The other thing is the AC is not working. When I press that AC button, you saw the compressor did not turn on. This car is going to need AC, especially living in the south here. Now with those two things in mind, I want to be fair to you, but I also want to be fair to me. Since you've already reduced the price so much, I feel another 200 off is fair, and that will satisfy both of us. Now. 200 is definitely not enough to cover the tires and definitely not enough to call it, cover the AC. So that puts the risk mostly on me and that gives me a little bit of incentive to continue with this purchase. That risk is on me, not you. You get cash in your hand, you don't have to worry about this. You don't have to negotiate with anyone else. So once you come to an agreement on the price, check over the title, get the title from them. You wanna make sure it still says clear or clean and no other issues, no branded, no loan on it. As long as it's what you were aware of in the listing, then you're good to go. Now on the title, it will say the VIN number. Find the VIN number on your car and compare. I've had it twice now where I've gone to buy a car, the seller's given me a title for a different car. And if I didn't check that over, I would have tried to register a different car at the DMV and that would be an issue. So definitely check over the title first before you hand over the money, before you sign the title or anything. And the last thing worth mentioning is how do you drive a car home that you just bought? You need insurance to drive legally. So few options, either you call to add insurance ASAP or if you can do it through the app, through your insurance's app, that's an excellent way to go. As soon as you hand over the money, get the title, add insurance through the app for that date. Most insurances can backdate like that. And so that is an excellent way to be able to legally drive a car with insurance. If you get pulled over, if you're, you live in a state where you can show electronic evidence, then you're good. Georgia is one of those states. 
if you're not in a state like that, then you might be in a different situation. Now, sometimes what may be a better solution is see the car out. If you like it, tell the seller, you'll be back tomorrow. We can sign the title. We can hand over the keys. I can give you the money. We will just do it the next day ASAP as soon as it is available or convenient to the seller. And in the meantime, you'll be adding this car on insurance, be able to print out the documents for the next day, and you're good to go. The other thing is sometimes you're buying a car without a license plate. Now, it's, it's legal to drive like this as long as you have insurance and as long as it's been under however many days your state says. Georgia is 10 days, I think, 7 or 10 days after purchase that you can drive until you're required to have your tag. So just a few things to keep in mind. That way you can safely and legally drive your car back home. And that will do it for this video. Hopefully that helped you. Hopefully that helps you buy your next used car off of Facebook Marketplace or wherever. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Lots more to come on my new daily Saturn.